So this panel um, that we're having now is uh, focused on best practices for initiating and maintaining community relationships. And we have a great panel of folks um, that are going to talk about this. The questions, we, we've heard a lot about you know, the demographics and the statistics and where projections are headed. We heard about 203 and some of the, the legal bulwarks that we have to uh, provide uh, action and uh, provide support to uh, communities that need support. Here, I think we're going to dive deep into some practical ways that advocates and election officials have identified to try to figure out how do you reach different communities? How do you work? Uh, with unique populations or unique states that are very different from each other, some urban, some very rural, um, to solve problems facing voters in different communities. And uh, we have, uh, again, two, two election officials um, and we have uh, two wonderful advocates to, uh, to, to address the, these questions and concerns. So uh, it's my pleasure, obviously, to introduce um, uh, the, the four individuals that we have in front of us. Um, Going first is Jonathan Stein, who's a staff attorney and program manager for Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, and Asian Law Caucus. Um, uh, Jonathan has been head of the voting rights program and was previously a voting rights a staff attorney for the ACLU of California. Uh, he serves as chair of the board of director, directors of California and Common Cause, is a commissioner at the Oakland Public Ethics Commission, and is a host of the podcast or web, seri uh, web video series uh, called In the Arena. While receiving his MPP and JD from UC Berkeley, Jonathan served as the student regent on University of California's Board of Regents, fighting for access, diversity, and affordability, and advocating for the interests of students in the UCA system. Uh, next, we have Indra Ariaga um, uh, from the, uh, the Election Language Assistance Compliance Manager for the Office of Lieutenant Governor for, of Alaska, who, which, as we know, uh, runs uh, ele elections on the statewide level in Alaska. Um, uh, uh, Indra holds a BA and a Master's in Political Science from St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, far away from Alaska. Um, she has worked as a research analyst and a consultant uh, for almost two decades with con concentrations on equity research, energy, and community-level social and economic analysis. In her current post, Indra works uh, native, uh, Alaska Native language panels to develop election materials in Alaska Native languages. Uh, next, we have Julie Wise, uh, who is the Director of Elections for King County, Washington, or Seattle, as we generally know it better. Uh, throughout her time at uh, King County, uh, Ms. Wise has been a proponent of significant reforms that have made uh, King County elections a national and international model for voting by mail. Driven by accuracy and transparency, uh, Wise focuses her administration on innovative solutions to expedite vote tabulation, um, uh, expand voter outreach and education, and increase voter access in Washington's uh, largest county. Uh, prior to her election in 2015, Wise served as Deputy Director of Elections, managing all the day-to-day -day operations of the elections in King County. She's a nationally certified election registration administrator. She's attended leadership cor uh, courses at the Evans School and Harvard Kennedy School and has served King County for more than 14 years. And last but certainly, certainly not least, we have Brittany Baker, who's counsel for the Fair Elections Legal Network. She focuses there on uh, removing barriers to registration and voting for traditionally underserved uh, communities through both legislative advocacy as well as litigation. Ms. Baker has been with FELN since December 2015. Uh, prior to that, she's worked on a variety of civil rights matters, including voting rights, disability rights, and health care access. Ms. Baker is a member of the Florida Bar and the District of Columbia Bar, and she holds a JD from Florida State University College of Law and her, her bachelor's degree at the University of Florida. So with that, I'd love uh, for you all to welcome the panelists and really look to dive deep into the question of how do we have a better relationship between election officials, advocates, how do you find different ways to reach out and talk to the communities that you're in, uh, and really solve some of these language access problems that we're struggling with. So uh, with that, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, um, and uh, thanks very much um, for the introduction. Uh, so I'm the head of the voting rights program at 
Asian Americans Advancing Justice in San Francisco, and you heard earlier from my counterpart in our affiliate in Los Angeles, Deanna Kitamura, who had the same uh, graphic on her lead slide. Um, that's the cover of our report that we released last month that is the largest examination of language access in California elections ever completed. There's some copies on the back table. I have some up at the front as well, in case you're interested. Um, it was the uh, end product of a year-long effort in 2016 to hold elections officials accountable to their language access requirements in federal and state law, but also to support those elections officials and work collaboratively with them on um, developing and implementing best practices. And you'll hear about a lot of that here, but Deanna presented the results of that effort, the actual data from the report earlier. I'm gonna focus more on engaging community. So um, some of this is, uh, was seen yesterday, but we have really, I mean, sorry, earlier today, but we have really widespread language access in California. So um, we had the opportunity last year to work in uh, Latino communities and in a variety of Asian American communities. Um, we have widespread federal law coverage, Section 203 coverage, uh, but as was mentioned earlier today, we also have a state law that mandates language access and voting. It applies to communities that are much smaller than Section 203, so it provides language access in a wider range of communities, but it offers much, much less. And we're currently engaged in a legislative campaign to improve the state law's language access requirements. Um, and we can talk, if anyone's interested, we can talk about that bill that we're moving through the state legislature uh, privately. So in California, uh, about three quarters of our Latino and Asian American communities speak a language other than English at home, and over one third of both of those communities um, identifies limited English proficient. So we have really substantial communities of folks, uh, who, millions and millions of voters, frankly, um, who need some form of language assistance in order to vote. So in 2016, um, we uh, had a three-part program one was community education and outreach. Uh, one was meeting with elections officials and doing advocacy around best practices. And one was our actual election day poll monitoring program that was in 1,300 polling places and we believe was the largest field poll monitoring program in the nation. I'll take these piece by piece. So first, our community education and outreach work. We partnered with 20 community-based organizations um, on four different things. We, we went to them with a small subgrant, uh, just a couple thousand dollars each, if they could work with us on the following four things. The first was, um, we translated Know Your Voting Rights materials into 13 languages, um, and we brought whichever ones were relevant for the particular language community that we were working with, and we asked if they would distribute them to their community members. Two, we hosted workshops. Um, we asked these organizations to help us host workshops uh, in which we would talk to first-time voters about how to register to vote, how to vote, what their rights were on election day, how they could receive language assistance in voting, and so on. Um, we asked them to agree uh, to be connected with their county elections official. Um, we found that the county elections officials had a couple long-standing relationships in minority language communities, and when we asked them what outreach they did, they said basically, we reach out to the same three or four or five, or in some really proactive counties, maybe seven or eight people every election cycle. Um, and what we wanted to do was to break them out of that um, cycle of usual suspects and introduce them to a wider range of folks, and that meant sometimes more community leaders in the Latino community or their first ever contact with a leader in the Vietnamese community or the um, Cambodian community or whatever the case may be. Um, and we asked the community partner organizations to help us recruit um, bilingual poll workers and poll monitors. And I wanna focus on this for one second. Uh, elections officials really asked us, it was important to them um, that when we went and recruited bilingual poll monitors that would work with us on election day that we didn't effectively steal from them a possible recruit for um, poll working, someone who could be a bilingual poll worker. In a lot of instances, they said, you know, we don't have much difficulty recruiting Spanish-speaking poll workers or maybe Chinese-speaking poll workers, but we have a heck of a time um, uh, reaching folks in the Korean community or the Vietnamese community, or whatever the case may be. And so when we worked with community organizations, we always said first and foremost, um, there is an opportunity to be an all-day poll worker You'll be paid, the experience looks like X, Y, and Z, and it's a service to your community. It's the highest service you could provide to your community on election day. If you can't make a full day commitment, we uh, have an alternative for you, which is that you could be a poll monitor with us for maybe four hours in the morning or four hours in the afternoon. Um, so we put poll workers first um, to the extent we could because it was part of deepening our relationships with our election official partners. So out of that, um, some tips on, Adam asked me to present some tips for elections officials on how to reach um, the, the um, minority language communities that sometimes that are hard to penetrate. Um, so here they are. First and foremost, I think this is the easiest one, 
cultural and linguistic competency. So if you have a staff member who speaks Spanish or grew up in the local Latino community, you're going to have a much easier time um, with that person going to a community fair uh, or a community meeting or engaging community leaders one-on-one -on -one, um, than if you send someone with a different background profile and set of language skills. Uh, and that may require diversifying your staff, your hiring. Um, that's a long-term commitment and investment you're making um, on language outreach. Second, meet people where they are. Um, if possible, don't ask them to come to your office at the county seat, if that means they have to drive um, even half an hour. It's probably more than someone who has a full-time job and kids and other obligations to make when they're doing this on a volunteer basis. They're working on behalf of their community on a volunteer basis. So if you can send someone who has that cultural and linguistic competency to the meeting that already exists the first Tuesday of every month, um, or whatever the case may be uh, within a particular language community, go there, meet them where they are. Uh, try to address the specific, try to know in advance and address the specific needs of the community. So for example, in the Filipino American community, um, it's a longer standing community with um, an earlier history of immigration than other communities, um, and there is much less need for language assistance. And sometimes if you go into Filipino American communities, sometimes, not always, if you go in and say, uh, how can we ensure language access or Tagalog language materials for you and your community, people will, particularly older immigrants who take great pride in having lived in America for decades and having learned English, will be offended that you will suggest that they need um, some form of language assistance. Now, that's not in all instances, but I've encountered that personally a couple times, and so um, there's, there's nuance there uh, that's worth learning. Also. Um, some members of the Filipino-American community insist that the language spoken um, by Filipino-Americans is Filipino, and others insist it's Tagalog. And so it's worth knowing the landscape um, where you live. And then, um, this is sort of specific to California, but what we realized was that under state law of um, Indian-American communities that live in our Central Valley, um, the, the fruit basket of, California, of, of the nation in many ways, um, we're receiving Hindi language assistance. And I'm Indian American, and I uh, have grown up in Northern California, and I knew that there were no Hindi speakers in the Central Valley. It, it was Punjabi speakers. It was a long-standing Punjabi American community that, had, um, that lived in the Central Valley. And so we were able to realize that there was a community with a very specific unmet need. Um, and when uh, Deanna and I and Asian Americans Advancing Justice in California approached that community with this problem, it, was, um, it created a new campaign for them that they're now leading themselves. Uh, and then the other, the last thing I'll say is um, offer value. So it's hard if you're going into these communities and saying, we need you to help us learn how to do community outreach better. We need you to help us check our translations. We need you to help us recruit bilingual poll workers. Um, if you're offering something of value to them, um, that's huge. And a lot of times you're reaching out to community-based organizations that have three or four part-time staff, all of whom are volunteers. Um, and if you can find uh, some way to support them, and sometimes that means financial support, this is probably more relevant for the larger advocacy organizations in the room that can subgrant as opposed to elections officials. But if you can find some way to support them, um, it, it really goes a long way in building trust. Okay, um, we would meet with elections officials and do advocacy on best practices. We met with every co uh, county elections office at least once. We brought a long list of questions about how they met their language access requirements. We nudged them where we felt um, they weren't perhaps um, complying fully with the law. Um, but more importantly, I think, we acted as a hub for best practices. Every county we found had one idea they were really proud of, or one thing they did that went above and beyond, but they weren't explaining that to their neighbors. And so we began collecting best practices um, and then distributing them out as we met with additional counties. Um, we developed uh, materials that summarized our best practices, created webinars that we presented statewide, and we were able, I think very successfully in fact, by November to have worked with counties to implement best practices that we hadn't brainstormed. We had actually taken from their colleagues within the elections community. Uh, so we found that very successful. Now, um, Matt asked me to address how we, we spoke about or how we addressed noncompliance. The first thing I'll say is that in California, at least, a lot of the Section 203 noncompliance we found was not elections officials screwing up, but it was poll workers who weren't familiar with um, what was required of them. And so we went to poll worker trainings. Um, we asked to see poll worker training documents in advance. Um, and we suggested additional emphasis where we felt it was necessary. And we pointed to past data from previous elections where um, in a county we were able to say, look, this percentage of your translated uh, ballots required under Section 203 were missing. Perhaps it's uh, worthwhile to spend an additional 90 seconds on Section 203 and what it requires, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I guess this is a message to the advocates in the room. Attending poll worker trainings can be a really effective way 
of um, boosting Section 203 compliance before you encounter problems on Election Day. Uh, but what about litigation? It is on the table for us. Um, so let me share one story with you. We had a county that we poll monitored in in June of 2016 in California's primary election um, that almost totally failed their language access obligations under state law. Uh, it was a real mess. And so what did we do? Um, we could have sued. Uh, we wrote them a letter documenting their failures. We laid out actions they could take um, to get themselves in shape by November. We laid out ways we could support them. We, were, we laid out all a, sort, a variety of ways we could offer them support as they traveled a path from noncompliance to compliance. And then I concluded with, and you don't need to read this, I'll read it for you. Um, we, sh we know you share our goal of elections that are fully accessible to all language communities. The collaboration we propose here can help us achieve that goal while also avoiding litigation that could otherwise be used to enforce the law in this area. Um, and happily, the elections official in question, I have to give him an enormous amount of credit, received that letter with a spirit of collaboration, worked with us on a very regular timetable to improve um, what they were doing. Um, I went and met with the office multiple times. And in November, not only were they on par with their colleagues in complying with their state law language access requirements, they were one of the best counties we saw. Um, they met their language access requirements uh, at a higher rate than every other county, and they implemented best practices that we think lead the state in many respects. So they deserve enormous credit. I'll wrap up here. Um, Deanna already mentioned the poll monitoring work we did and the fact that we were in 25 counties encompassing 33 million California residents. Uh, it was in uh, almost 600 volunteers and almost 1,300 polling places. And if you want to know the results, again, as Deanna mentioned, they're all in the report. Okay, I'm done. Thanks so much. Next, we have Indra Ariaga from Alaska. Good afternoon, and thank you. Um, I know it's after lunch, so thank you for sticking with us. Um, I, I have a very, very short presentation because we were told five minutes. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to, to get through this in a lively way. So uh, my name is Indra Riaga. I'm with the Division of Elections for the State of Alaska. Um, I was brought on um, in 2016, and uh, let me oh this one sorry. I want to firstly introduce you to um, our governor and our lieutenant governor. Uh, we're very very thankful for their support because everything that we're doing is new. Everything that we're doing we're doing it as like a super high pays, uh, and they've been very supportive to just let us run with it, and it has made a world of difference for our state and our communities, so we definitely want to thank them. So our language needs in Alaska are very unique, extremely unique, and it's been a privilege uh, to do the work uh, for, the, for the state. And so under the 203 determination um, in 2016, our number of communities and languages almost doubled. We weren't expecting that, so I was really glad to hear a little bit from the census and I'll be following up with them, um, because it's a very, very high, um, high mandate to meet. But what we're doing is we, we're working under Section 203. We're also complying with two settlements that the state lost, one in 2007 uh, and one in, in 2014, uh, which basically tell us which specific materials and uh, scopes have to be uh, complied with in different regions. What we're trying to do as a state is standardize everything. So we know what we have to do at a minimum for everybody, and then we're trying to build on that based on priorities you know, from um, a legal perspective. So currently, uh, in 2016, we provided uh, election materials in six, dialect, six dialects of UPIC and that's UPIC with an apostrophe. Whenever you see UPIC without an apostrophe, it's a completely different language. Um, we also did Gwich'in, which is an Athabascan language. We proactively started language panels in Inupiaq. There are two uh, dialects of Inupiaq, Northern Inupiaq and Seward Peninsula Inupiaq. Um, and we, we were also providing Spanish, Tagalog, Koyukon, which is another Athabascan language, um, and uh, uh, Siberian Yupik. That one has been a little bit challenging, but we're, we're getting on board with that one. Uh, with the new determinations, we're adding Aleut, which is all the way 
down the chain. Um, and that's also going to be challenging because right now we don't have any materials in them. We don't have any speakers. Uh, we don't have any translators at this time. Um, and we're also uh, doing Nunivak Chupik, which applies to one of the islands off of the darker blue part of the map. Um, that's also new. So what we did in 2016, um, these are some of the materials that we actually produce. We produce sample ballots in all those languages. Um, that was huge. Uh, we also did glossaries. Our glossary, um, prior to 2016, we had one glossary in Yupik, in a general form of Yupik. It included 74 terms. Um, with the guidance from NARF um, and also, you know, working with, with different groups, we expanded that uh, glossary from 74 to 180 terms. Um, and then we also did it uh, in the six dialects of Yupik. Uh, we have a preliminary Nunivak Chupik uh, glossary, and then we did it also in Gwich'in Athabascan. Um, I have to say that Gwich'in Athabascan was one of the most challenging uh, work, you know, panels to work with just because it's such, such a difficult language and um, not that many speakers. And um, we got 100% compliance with, uh, with Gwich'in, and that's just like, I mean, you have no idea how great that is. Um, anyway, so uh, over there on the, on the left, what you'll see is the language um, assistance glossary. It's online, so you can actually go on our website and listen to the, to the Gwich'in words um, and, and that's, we will be doing the same thing with all the Yupik uh, dialects, and we'll also be doing the same thing with the Inupiaq dialects and the Nunivak. So our goal for the end of 2017 is to have the audio glossaries all online and to have the written glossaries um, in Nunivak and Inupiaq as well. So that's, that's, that's our goal for 2017. 2018, I don't know yet. Um, <laughs> but, but it's huge, and what you see there, um, the ones that are like green, and then there's a little red booklet. Those are the official election pamphlets. Uh, those were new. They had never been done in the history of Alaska. And so those are all in Yupik. The red one is, is Gwich'in. So how do, we, how do we ensure success? What's our strategy for success in the future? Um, we're still working on this. It's, it's a work in progress. It will always be a work in progress. But we found that the challenges in 2016 had to do with expert speakers, so who, who does the translations, uh, logistics, how we do them, technology, what tools we use, uh, workflow, how everything kind of fits together, um, and then reporting, you know, like how we measure success and uh, reporting for the courts and just reporting for our own benefit. Um, what we're looking at, uh, you know, in, in terms of developing solutions in the future um, include well, the, the, main, the main tool that we need to be successful is our relationships with the panel members and with the tribes. Without those relationships, nothing happens. And that has taken a lot of work, and we're really happy to be in a place where we have built a lot of trust, and we need to honor that trust and really move forward you know, with the best foot forward. And, and I think that that applies probably for all your communities as well, and poll workers and everything. Without trust, you really don't have anything. Um, and so we'll be working with Alaska Federation of Natives, Get Out the Native Vote folks, uh, individual tribes, Tenant and Chiefs Conference, um, all kinds of organizations, as many as we can, as we can get uh, relationships with. Um, we are also moving to a model in which we translate year-round, you know, not just on election years, but off election years, uh, we're translating all those things that would be nice to have. For example, our current voting registration form is only in English. So, you know, right now we're, we're working to having a sample registration form in Yupik and um, in Gwich'in. You know, so, so we're, we, we have inadvertently started this sort of like rolling, you know, deliverable um, standards that, that we're working towards. Um, one of our main challenges in Alaska, as you may imagine, has to do with uh, transportation, logistics, broadband. Uh, we don't have much of any of that. Um, and so, for example, for Gwich'in, our process for translation was I would mail, you know, an envelope in the mail with the forms and everything that we needed translated. Our panel members would get them our, up in Arctic Village, which is north of, in northern Alaska. They would handwrite everything. They would fax it or mail it back. They would have to type it in. 
and then go to another panel member and they would check our grammar, you know, and then we would more, make more changes and then we'd do it again. And so, um, so that's been really tough. But one of, the, so what, one of the things that we're doing right now is trying to figure out how we can work with our panel members and, you know, surplus. There are computers out there in, in the state surplus um, that we were able to pull and refurbish and we've sent some out to uh, some of our panel members. Um, so, you know, just being creative, ways that don't cost a lot of money. Um, and then from my end, uh, we've, uh, we've developed a database and a content management system. And part of it is that we're trying to capture as much of the translations as possible in a way that's standardized and it's formatted. Because um, as our panel members get older and, and as our elders pass, we're not gonna have the same resources. And so being able to know what a translation is and so for example for our public service announcements they rarely change what changes are you know are the times and the dates so we've made sure that when they do a PSA they say everything in UPIC except for November 4th 8 p.m. because people understand that no matter where so that allows us to capture it and in the future just change out the dates so you know just trying to find ways to work and capture um, content as we go that's important. Um, and then also involve other parts of um, people even within the, the Division of Elections. You know, language tends to be its own program and it kind of supplements everything else in the state. Uh, but to have an active conversation with all the regional managers helps us get their buy-in and also helps us make sure that you know, we continue to do what actually works as opposed to what we think works. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. We're, you know, we're just, we're working uh, in, in 2018. I have no idea what it's gonna be like, but you know, our goal is gonna be to translate and be compliant as, as much as possible. I do anticipate that we're gonna go from the seven languages that we did to probably double that. Um, so that's, uh, that'll be exciting, thank you. And Julie Wise is next. Thank you. It's an honor to be here this afternoon. It's my first time in Virginia, and I'm counting DC too since I officially flew in there. I'm excited to be here, except for this is my third time in as many months getting the session right after lunch, so I'm not sure what that says about me, but I'm not going to try to take it personally. Um, thanks, Adam, to clarify that I'm from King County, Washington, which is Seattle area and beyond, so the Starbucks, Nirvana, you're welcome, or I'm sorry, either way. Um, I know we share that name with some other counties uh, across the region. So a little bit of a different twist here. I'm a vote by mail county, and we have been since 2009. So for the last eight years, we've been entirely vote by mail in the state of Washington. So you won't hear me reference polling places. and um, I'm happy about that, sorry, but I am. <laughs> uh, so again, but our voters, when we went to vote by mail, they had already self-selected that they liked vote by mail. We had 90% of our voters that were already getting their ballots by absentee. So um, King County, we have 1.28 million registered voters. Uh, we were or are the largest entirely vote by mail jurisdiction. I have to relook that stat now that California's up to all kinds of things. Um, so, here we go. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of what we think we're doing to improve voting, uh, voter access and language access in King County. Um, as we heard earlier in the session, we're becoming, the, becoming increasingly diverse. We're, we have one in five residents that speak a language other than English at home, and supporting language access in voting is more important than ever. We current off, currently offer translated election materials in four languages, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, and Spanish. We have a five member language services team that is internal along with the 65 other employees at King County Elections that do all of our translation internally in our office as well as do community outreach. But beyond that, I'm going to talk about how we're increasing language, language access in three ways. One, adding new languages to translated election materials, Two, working with community-based organizations to reach out to limited English-speaking communities. 
and three, increasing ballot drop boxes in key demographic areas. In 2015, the King County Council passed an ordinance that really went beyond the federal Section 203 requirements and set a more inclusive standard, similar to what we've seen in LA and beyond. We can look at additional languages, I and mean, we can look at additional data, such as data from schools, from hospital and public health figures, court numbers, to determine the need. And in that, in 2015, we determined that Spanish and Korean translations, though we were not required by Section 203, would be right to add in King County. Being vote by mail and not including five different language ballots, we wanted to make sure that people could get signed up to receive their materials. Whoops. So we sent customized translated emails with a link to an online request form where voters can request their language preference. The emails were targeted based on the most popular surnames among Chinese, Korean, Latino, and Vietnamese voters. Something that I was once concerned to do, our community-based organizations encouraged us to do this. We also posted announcements with a link to the language request form on our blog and social media channels such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We did print ads placed in Asian, Latino, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Korean newspapers, and we ran Pandora radio ads in Spanish that people could receive their materials in Spanish now. We also started a community-based um, partners organization. When I ran for office in 2015, I attended a candidate forum with about 100 Vietnamese civic group members. I asked the audience if any of them knew that, we were, that we could, they could receive their ballot materials in Vietnamese, and only one person raised their hand. So I knew that we had a lot of work to do, because for several years we had actually been offering ballots and voter pamphlets in Vietnamese, but they, we only had a very few number of people that actually registered to receive those materials. So we knew we needed to get innovative, and we needed to get the word out. And I knew that we needed to work directly with our community-based organizations and our leaders who represent the community's limited English-speaking populations. These organizations have been doing civic engagement for a long time and have built trust within their communities. They should be supported, and we should use communities to engage their communities. So in 2016, we piloted a new program to improve language access in underserved communities. King County Elections partnered with the Seattle Foundation which is a very well-known and respected uh, philanthropic group in the area and charity organization. Together, the partnership provided $224,000 in funding for community-based organizations to do voter outreach in limited English-speaking communities. About 30 organizations applied and 22 received funding. The organizations were each required to develop an actual field plan, an outreach plan, how they intended to engage voters in their community. Over the course of several months, they provided educational workshops, candidate and ballot forums, voter registration drives, and other community events. In the two months leading up to the general election, they organized 20 different events to educate community members about what was on the ballot. Collectively, the organizations reached about 27,000 people in 30 different languages in King County. I find that oftentimes government leans on these community-based organizations but we don't really provide the support. And the support, as was mentioned earlier by Jonathan, oftentimes comes in funding. Um, and so I'm proud that we were able to do that um, coordination with the Seattle Foundation. We also know that there's some community-based organizations that don't necessarily have a, a, a big structure around them. So what we also did is we hired four community ambassadors to engage voters and potential voters among the Ethiopian, Filipino, Russian, Ukrainian, and Samoan communities. Many of these communities really lacked organizational infrastructure, so that outreach through ambassadors was the perfect resource for us. The community ambassadors organized workshops and ballot demonstrations. They also helped people create a voter registration form or fill out a voter registration form, learn how to update voter information, and where to find a ballot drop box. Together, they reached 500 community members. Our community outreach efforts paid off huge. We had a 62% increase in overall request for translated materials since the first language Chinese was implemented in 2002. In total, 5,400 translated ballots were issued for the 2016 general election. Throughout the program, we solicited regular feedback from our community partners and held a final debrief at the end of the year. 
the community organizations shared that access and translated materials was not the biggest barrier to participation. They said there was a greater need for basic voter education and as how voting works in King County and who is actually eligible. Quickly, I'm going to switch topics just for a second because I think when we look at all this information in the vote by mail world, um, we also need to look at how we're providing services. So another thing when I got elected that I realized we needed desperately is for almost 1.3 million registered voters, we had 10 permanent drop boxes. So immediately, and when I got elected, we added 33 more drop boxes. But where are you going to put them? So what I looked at was that this here is a map that our equity and social justice office in King County did, that the more sort of maroon or darker areas um, are showing de demographic data of people of color, lower income, and limited English speaking areas. So when we went to go put our drop boxes, I wanted to make sure that we put drop boxes on underserved and historically underrepresented communities in King County that don't have access necessarily to stamps. So of the 43 drop boxes, 26 scored highest in key equity demographic characteristics according to our study at, at King County, and drop boxes were installed in culturally distinct and geographically isolated communities. I'm gonna switch back real quick just to find Final thoughts, this year I'm really excited. We rolled out our voter education fund. So this year we expanded the community partners program to fund even more organizations. We once again teamed up with the Seattle Foundation to create the voter education fund. And we have funded more than $400,000 in grants to community-based organizations across King County to do voter engagement. We're focusing on the county's underserved communities, not just limited English speaking communities, but communities such as communities of color, limited English speaking communities, people experiencing homelessness and veterans and those that are re-entering after um, having a felony. About 60 organizations applied for funding. After a careful selection process, I'm really excited that after a lot of management through numbers, we just announced that 30 organizations will receive funding this year. Funded organizations represent a diverse range of historically underserved communities across King County. They include Longhouse Media, which produces media relating to Native issues and people, the Ingersoll Gender Center, a community-based organization that serves transgender and gender diverse people. We're really excited to see how the organizations engage their communities in what will be a very important election for us here in King County. We always have four elections every year. And this year is a very important local election, where, as you all know, um, we'll see more than 80% turnout in a presidential election, and then we'll see some 20, 30% determine um, the election for the others, which I often say that means this group right here gets to determine what the rest of us get to eat for tonight, where, et cetera. So we can't have that happening, so it's really important for us to take the momentum of the 2016 presidential election put it right into 2017 where we have an important local election. I really want to ensure that all of our citizens make their voices heard. Thanks again for having me this afternoon. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, we have uh, Brittany Baker from Fair Elections Legal Network. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that my presentation backs up on um, what Jonathan spoke about earlier, um, because we're both uh, legal support organizations and policy-oriented organizations, not election officials. So I think we have many of the same best practices. However, unlike um, his organization, we are a national-based organization. We work in about 20 states nationwide, but we follow the policy conversation in all 50 states um, whenever we can. So in about 20 states, we work directly with state-based organizations on a variety of election-related issues and topics, um, one of which is forging relationships with their elections officials um, for a number of reasons. Like many of the panelists have said already, enhancing the involvement of language minority communities in elections leads to higher voter turnout. The other thing that I always like to emphasize is that it also leads to success in the ability of voters to actually cast a ballot that is counted. Um, just voting is one thing, but having your ballot counted successfully um, really sh shows the payoff that you have in your community 
and the efforts that you've had to connect with your election officials um, has paid off. Um, in addition, um, you, as election officials, you can better integrate your staff time to meet the needs of your community and um, actually target your resources to focus on the issues that um, the community needs served. So for community organizations, I like to break this down into two um, areas of focus because I know that the, the needs of elections officials and community organizations are different, but there's a way that we can make them work together. Um, and so for community organizations, I always like to tell them, first of all, do not wait to speak to your elections officials eight weeks before an election, because that's usually when the bell rings that you need uh, to find out what's going on. Be proactive. Plan at least a year in advance to begin talking about that next year's election. And once you have that first meeting, you can continually meet with them every few months to check in. Um, but I've had organizations come to me two months before an election saying, we don't know what's going on. Can you help us connect with them? And I tell them that it's probably too late, but we can try to start. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is come to the meetings with elections officials um, after taking stock of what your community needs. Don't just come um, in an antagonistic point of view saying that you're not meeting the needs of our community, but work on this relationship to educate them um, in terms of what your community needs. Um, and things that you can think about while you're taking stock of what your community needs is, um, can you offer services? Can you help them translate ballots? Can you, even once they are translated, just make sure that they are um, getting the point across in the way that your community needs or that the grammar is correct or anything else that could affect the voter from reading a ballot um, and actually understanding it. Um, also, like many have said already, um, how can you help recruit bilingual poll workers? Um, time and time again, poll workers are the, uh, the gate to actually being able to successfully vote. And so um, when somebody with limited English proficiency comes into the, into the polling place, if they're met with somebody who speaks their language, we find that more often than not, they are successfully voting um, at a ballot that is counted. Um, and then also just come with the mindset that the goal of the meeting is to work together, not to point out all the problems that you're having with them, but to try to figure out how you can forge a relationship to um, solve problems in the future. And next, for the elections officials, whenever um, I think about this uh, from their point of view, um, I always like to ha have them utilize the expertise of their community. There are so many resources out there that are available to them at little to no cost um, when organizations in the community want to provide services for their members. They often know that the government officials have limited financial and time resources. So providing services to your elections officials is a way to create a symbiotic relationship where your um, voters can get what they need, um, the elections officials can get what they need, and we can save time and resources on both sides. Um, we covered that topic. Uh, and then I also just like to um, have everyone consult regularly with the community. Um, like I said, on the point of the uh, state-based organizations or community organizations, be proactive and communicate with your elections officials early. The same thing needs to happen on the side of the elections officials as well. Um, like Julie just mentioned, there were resources that her office was creating that her, the community just didn't know existed. And so um, communicating the fact that you have these resources early and directly to your uh, state-based or community-focused organizations will hopefully bridge the gap between what is already there um, and what the community needs. And so utilize these organizations as a trusted resource. When one person knows about a resource, encourage them to spread the word to others. We can kind of create these channels of information um, in a grassroots manner if we do this early. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on, um, which also has been discussed before, so I'm sorry if any of this is repetitive, is to um, recruit bilingual poll workers. It's so, so, so important. I just had to give a plug out to my organization's website, workelections.com. We have uh, created a pilot program in seven states that um, is a compendium of anything that a voter would want, ever need or want to know about uh, becoming a poll worker. And so when you pull up your a jurisdiction, I did my home uh, county right here, it has all the time requirements, how to apply, um, what you need to know and any restrictions on being a poll worker. And so we're trying to create this resource. Yes, it's only in English right now, but um, again, we're trying to recruit bilingual poll workers. So we would need um, anybody to serve in that capacity to have some English speaking and reading ability. Um, hopefully we can translate in the future. 
Um, but we've created this resource and hope to spread it nationwide in order to facilitate um, the recruitment of poll workers that are not only bilingual but tech savvy. Um, we all know that the landscape of elections are changing. There, is, there are iPads when you check in. Um, that did not happen and unfortunately the poll workers are not keeping up with the needs of the technology these days. Um, and also to try to recruit some younger poll workers as well just so that when you're walking into the polls you're faced with um, the diverse uh, people of your community, whether it's age or language ability or whatever that may be. Um, so that's that. Um, and then before I wrap up, I just wanted to give an anecdote as to how these relationships can pay off for both the elections official and for the community. Um, once you're plugged in and working together, you can figure out um, what, once, you're, once the community organizations know exactly what's happening, they can kind of pinpoint um, when something is not being implemented properly or um, other issues that the language minority community might have been experiencing in the past but didn't know that that was a problem. So for example, in Louisiana, um, New Orleans specifically, we were pointed to an issue where um, once the community became involved in, in elections and were started to register voters, they found that uh, the voters that were not born in the United States but were United States citizens were regularly being asked to provide proof of citizenship. Um, these voters did not know that that was not okay until they had begun to register voters in their community and kind of know the rules of the game uh, more closely. So uh, that is a case that we did have to sue them in order to get a uh, proper resolution, but um, had they, the state been able to resolve this and stop asking for this proof of citizenship without us filing the lawsuit, we would have been happy with that outcome as well. Um, but that's just an example of an issue that we would not have been aware of had we not had um, integrated community involvement. So, thank you. Great. Thanks to all the panelists. Uh, we have some time for questions. And so, Sean Green in the back uh, will have the mic and we'll run to anyone that has uh, their hand raised. Who has their hand raised first? Come on. I have some questions if no one, up. Oh, there's a question right there. an all vote by mail system, what sort of challenges do you have in terms of pre-election outreach um, to make sure that you're hitting all of those language minorities that don't have a place to show up on election day? Okay, this one. Um, well, um, outreach in Alaska is, is really complicated um, and particularly bilingual outreach uh, because it's really, really difficult to find bilingual uh, outreach workers. And so the, um, the Division of Elections is divided into four regions and bilingual and outreach workers are done at the regional level. So they're not, they're not done through the language assistance program itself. We provide all the materials. We provide uh, the materials also for training. And on occasion, we go out into uh, the hubs and, and do training ourselves. So, so that's how, how that works. We do uh, solicit, um, you know, from the tribes uh, who would be a, a good bilingual worker. Part of uh, the the challenge is in making sure that the bilingual worker is um, certif well not well, cert it's, there's no official certification, uh, but that but that can meet all the requirements and all the needs of of the voters. And so because we're based out of Anchorage and like I'm bilingual but not in an Alaskan native language, um, it's very difficult for me to say, oh yeah, that, that's, that person knows Yupik, right? Uh, so we really do rely on um, partnerships and particularly with the tribes. So they kind of vouch for a person. They say this person is a good resource. Uh, the communities are also very tight. And so, um, so we will hear if somebody is not you know, doing a good translation or, or if there's somebody else who they would recommend. Um, so that training goes on um, in terms of the elections um, from, the, from the regional 
offices, uh, and they're usually scheduled a few months before the election. That in and of itself can be challenging because uh, of our own seasonality, you know, where we do uh, training, let's say, in, in March, but the election is not until June. And then, you know, it's fishing season and it's subsistence and traditional um, harvesting. And so that, that presents some challenges. Um, in terms of the off season or off election year, so like this year for, for outreach, uh, we're relying on partnerships and on being in places where other people are gonna be. So it's really costly to travel in Alaska. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, I could book two round trip tickets to Hawaii and have a vacation for $1,300 from Anchorage, or I could go to one of the Aleutian Islands for one person, right, for the same amount. So it becomes really expensive. Uh, and so we're relying more on technology, we're relying more on partnerships, we're relying more on positioning ourselves to be where other big gatherings are happening, you know, to be able to do that. So. James, I think you're picking up on that in the vote by mail world, because we do have the five languages, including English, that we do not mail out bilingual ballots. So we don't mail out five different ballots to each individual. So um, in the voter registration rules that we keep at King County, we're keeping voters' language preferences even language preferences that we don't currently offer. Um, and they can make that known by filling out a voter registration form that's in, I think we have about 15 different languages. So yes, that's absolutely a challenge, is that prior to elections, that we need to know what materials voters want to receive in, in what languages. Um, but so we're, we're trying to do that outreach all year long, that sort of the voter education fund is something that um, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a presidential election f thing, um, but is rather it's a part of our business now. That's how we do business now, as we do um, community engagement and outreach all year long, every year. Um, one of the things that I, that I do like that we uh, offer at King County and across Washington State um, and, and other counties is the opportunity for voters to access their ballot online. So if we get so close to election day that I just can't physically get a ballot in the mail and, in, and to you on time for you to vote in the language you preferred and you didn't sign up earlier in the process, voters can um, go online in those five different languages and access their ballot. It's a PDF ballot, no one's voting online, they're just accessing their ballot that we would have mailed them. They can um, print that out and then send that back into us. But it is a challenge in the vote by mail world to not have um, vote sent. We do have a couple vote centers in, in addition to that though I should have added. Um, depending on the election, uh, we'll have a handful of vote centers across the county that also provide touch screen units in those languages. Uh, Matt Masterson with the EAC. Uh, question for the, the whole panel. Uh, as you look at building, everyone talked about relationships and taking advantage of the communities that are, that are there. Uh, is there a way that EAC, somebody could essentially set up um, and we've done this in the accessibility community for, for uh, voters with disabilities, but connection points in every state or even locality to build those relationships. So if a newly covered jurisdiction just doesn't know where to start, it would be great for them to be able to go to the EAC website or somewhere and say, you know, almost like a, I don't know, a dating site, like who do I contact, who do I call? Let's, let's go have a coffee and start to build this relationship. Is that like the, the, group, the groups in this room, not, you don't have to date me, that's the good news. Uh, Right, yeah, I'm swipe, never mind. Uh, the groups in this room and the election officials, like, how, would that one be helpful, and two, how would we go about doing that? Like, what, what would be the best approach to be able to do that? Um, so I, I can't speak to the viability of putting all, every sort of community organization, every minority language community under one roof or on one list or what have you. Um, that would be fantastic if something like that existed. But I can say sort of as a tip or set of tips for uh, an elections official who wants to find community organizations for the very first time, right? Let's say you're newly covered by Section 203. Um, I think Malcolm Gladwell had this idea that there are connectors, like p individuals who are connectors, right? Um, there are organizations who are connectors as well. So if you have a community foundation in your county or your city, that community foundation has probably funded or received an application for funding from most organizations rooted in your neighborhood, your city, or, or your county. Um, so you can ask them about all the organizations they've worked with or in the past or currently. 
you can find like let's say an advocacy letter to the county board of supervisors that was signed by a coalition of community advocates that might have 15 community organizations that work in the latino community or work in communities of color or work in low-income communities um, there are ways you can go to find existing coalitions and networks without having to rebuild them yourself once you find yourself under section 203 coverage I think it's a great idea. You should get on that right away. I'm just kidding. I mean, I think there's some national um, organizations that would be, I think, very helpful. I think it's a great idea to, to make a library of that. It makes a lot of sense to me. I know that you know in King County, we have a lot of local community-based organizations that are specific to, to that region. Um, but I think it makes a lot of sense. We post all of those um, organizations on our website. Um, but it's, it sounds like a, a, a great idea. So just a quick follow-up, I'm sorry. Uh, what is it? This is like calling House Beer at a party, right? Well, I'll just keep asking questions from the ACBC. But is there a checklist? So newly covered, and wh where do I start? What are the first five things I do as someone that just found out there? Did you all develop a checklist? Can we have it? Can we share it? Uh, how did you go about dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that we necessarily have a checklist, but I think we probably have a mental checklist that we can absolutely document. I think one of the things that uh, worked really well um, in, in King County is that, uh, you know, I know everyone, there's a lot of committees and there's lots of meetings, but one of the things that we did is we started a committee um, around the Chinese language because we really needed to figure out Cantonese, Mandarin, we needed to have a better um, relationship with that community to understand um, how we navigate. And so I, I think the same thing is true as of, of our Disability Advisory Committee. Um, in fact, across Washington, each county has to have one, and that gives you the opportunity to have those community members and elders and people that are known in the community to um, provide that information to you. But I think a checklist is a great idea. He's just full of them. Hi. Um, so from our perspective, um, connecting with people is really important, and two things that we've done uh, this year that we're in the process of doing is, one, uh, the lieutenant governor's office uh, has put together a working group and so there's definitely um, it's it, it's representatives from across Alaska from municipalities from organizations from um, you know the university from the language preservation just all the people that we know are stakeholders or have something uh, uh, to bring to the table and have concerns about voting so that so, so they're they're represented so we've got that directory of folks um, we've also been working uh, in a census work group that's also statewide because the issues that elections has with the census data is paralleled in all other industries, you know, in all other um, sec sectors. So, you know, so we started that. So, so one thing to look at, I think, when you're putting together not just the checklist of um, things that you do, like one, you know, con you know, figure out what languages it is, you know to uh, look at the cultural context of the languages. I think that's really important. Um, but, but three, really look at what other organizations are doing. And, and yeah, if you, could, if you could all be under one roof or at least link, that would be awesome. But um, I, I think the EAC, EAC should do it. I will just note too also that when we um, introduced Vietnamese in, in King County, we did have a list of things that we wanted to make sure that everything's translated. It was really important to us that when, whenever we add an, a new language, that it's on every sign, that it's on every ballot drop box, that it's on every material that we provide to our voters. And so we definitely had a checklist of that. I'd also just, I would be remiss not to say that the Secretary of State of Washington provides a lot of support for their counties that are um, providing translated materials as well as disability advisory um, committee and so um, if you haven't I would definitely look to, to that as a resource as well because I, I know in Washington State that's extremely helpful to get all of our counties together so that we've got some consi consistency um, and also we can share good ideas. Um, Cameron Sassen at Fairfax County so to um, the chairman's point I'm very willing to start the process of documenting what we've done and sort of uh, maybe even reaching out with either newly or recently covered jurisdictions and find out what they've done and start putting together the draft copy of maybe a checklist that the EAC can incorporate maybe with their language glossaries. Yeah. Uh, and because that was actually a huge help. And that's actually, I don't, I don't know if you guys maybe mentioned it. One thing I just want to give the EAC huge credit for 
um, are those multiple language glossaries um, that they maintain because there are have been a number of words that in different dialects and different languages that have been incredibly helpful for us to make sure that we have uniformity. But I think um, from our standpoint going into this and then four years ago with Spanish and I know other jurisdictions that might not have resources, if you get that letter from DOJ that says, congratulations, you're covered, you don't know where to start. So um, I'm willing to start that process for you. Awesome. It sounds like Sean Green started a language resources working group, and we appreciate that from Sean. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll take the moderator's privilege and actually ask uh, a question if there's a pause in the audience questions. I I'd love to actually dig in a little bit more with uh, Julie Wise on, on the concept of the, the outreach program. Um, you know, from my understanding, you know, in different parts of the country, there are different approaches that the local election officials have. Some folks uh, say, you know, we're like the auditor, we're, you know, we, we, we hold the election and, uh, and we do a good job and, and when we're done, we're done. Um, we, we've seen an increasing interest, I think, uh, amongst election officials in really taking a proactive approach and taking information about uh, elections, registration, how you get access to the ballot uh, to the communities in a, in a nonpartisan, non-ideological way. Uh, I'd love you to, for you to go a little bit more deeper into how you all have approached this in, in a way that um, is authentic to your community, that uh, provides information to different, uh, you know, perhaps formerly disenfranchised communities, and at the same time uh, stays true to, you know, a, a very bipartisan, uh, non-ideological stance. Uh, I think a lot of folks here are interested in trying to figure out how to engage with election officials and, and promote that type of uh, view. Great. Yes. So the office itself, of course, is nonpartisan, and I ran as an elected director of elections is also a nonpartisan position. And I think it's incredibly important to pe keep people keep guessing, you know, what way does Julie lean, and they, they should, shouldn't really know. And I think that that's important. But um, what I realized very quickly was that we were providing for 14 years Chinese materials, ballots and voters pamphlets. No one knew that they were available. And the same went for Vietnamese. And then it, you just take a step back and you go, it's not working. What we're doing is not working. You can't just build it and think that they will come Well, when they don't know about it. And so um, immediately I was um, realized some people throughout the community and I, and I think that um, and, and one of the individuals is, that we talked last night, Priscilla, is um, she immediately said, do you know Cherry K. Abiyab? And I said, yes. As soon as I got into office, I hired someone that I knew that could help me develop an intentional outreach program. It was, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of Bumper Shoot in Seattle or Folk Life or the different festivals we have. I know everyone has the Strawberry Festival or whatever, and we'd show up at those events and, and we'd set up our table it just didn't feel very intentional. It didn't feel like, what are we doing here and, and to what end and to what purpose? So I wanted to really make sure that we had an intentional outreach program and an effort where we could put some data and measurements behind it um, and that we could really lean on um, some philanthropic groups that do some great work in King County and have money and want to do this work in a nonpartisan way. It was a bit scary, I will say, to think, are we going to make sure that the Seattle Foundation and these 30 organizations are going to remain nonpartisan. But when you get people into the room and you talk about how important it is that we must do it in a nonpartisan way, they immediately understand it, they immediately get it, and they really believe it's their charge to make sure that all of the, the work that they're going to do in their community is completely nonpartisan. Um, so I think really leaning on people that, these are community-based organizations that have been doing this work for decades. Um, they have um, leaders in their communities, they're respected, they're known in their communities. It's a different thing for me to walk up and go to a door and say, hey, you need to register and you need to vote, it's really important. Well, who the heck are you? Um, and, and why should I do it just because you say so? Um, and so we want to really tap into that we have amazing community um, organizations. Um, I've got an amazing group of team that really support their communities and provide translation in their communities. And so it was a great opportunity, I'm not going to lie, as a, an election administrator and having an election administrator cap on for the last 17 years, I was a little bit nervous. I was nervous about making sure that we're, are we outside of our realm, but I think election administrators could talk till they're blue in the face about um, what is our role. 
Is our role to make sure that you get a ballot and when you return it, I count it? Or is it my role to engage and to um, encourage and to educate and to reach out? And um, I believe it's the latter. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any more, uh, one more question from Andy. Yeah, hi, Andy Kang from Advancing Just Chicago. I just had a question for the panel. And Julie, I think I'm hearing you right. Uh, so I hope this question uh, has some usefulness to the audience. Uh, do you track actual usage of different language ballots? And if so, is, is there a safe way that you can share that with the community groups that you work with so they can compare notes? I mean, I know we all use VAN and different uh, databases, but it, it would be great for us to know who actually uses ballots, maybe not necessarily where, but, I, and, and Jonathan, I, I don't know, I haven't been keeping track of California, so if you could share about that or other parts of the country that you all are aware of. We do, we're all about data, right? I mean, I'm an election geek through and through, and myself and my team are, are data geeks through and through. So um, in, in a vote by mail world, what we do is we register people, they tell us what their language preference is, and then yes, we, we have the data to say, um, in fact, in this last presidential election, the Korean community turned out at 84%. Um, which was huge, and this was their first year getting their languages, um, and, uh, their materials, election materials in their languages. Um, so we, we look to the Korean community to help us figure out how we can do better in some of those other communities as well. Um, but yes, we, we track all of that data and are always happy to share it. Um, part of the community or the voter education fund, um, part of that funding is based off of metrics, and it's about, I mean, you're going to go in and touch and talk to X amount of people. Um, because we wanna make sure that, that there's value and the people that I, I'm getting money from from my county council, that I make sure that, that you know, we have value in, in this work and making sure that we're flexible and nimble and if something's not working and we're not uh, contacting the right people that we move in and but we all have all that kind of data. I'd be happy to share it. Um, <laughs> very quickly, because I know we're out of time, um, our elections officials obviously can't say uh, X percentage of Latino voters in our county voted, but what they can say is that X number of voters requested their ballot in Spanish and Y number of those voters voted on election day. And then they'll provide that data historically so we can see as they change or improve their language access efforts if those numbers go up over time. We have good relationships with our elections officials because we put a lot of time into building trust with them and so they'll usually give us that data, but if you wanted it in your jurisdiction and couldn't get it, it's publicly available information, so there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to access it somehow. How about a round of hand, uh, a round for the, uh, the panel here. Thank you.